Greetings. Uh, we are uh, lots of people this afternoon. For me, it's afternoon, and this moment I'm in Lisbon, but I see here from uh, from Europe, from uh, the U.S. Uh, I see lots of different uh, locations. Uh, it's going very fast. Lots of people getting in. So a big uh, a greeting to you all. And uh, for this um, uh, for this uh, occasion, I prepared uh, for 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 us, also from Italy. Okay, great. So we have someone who's a, an expert on this matter, so from Viterbo. I prepared a, a slideshow to uh, share with you uh, in order to comment about uh, this uh, fantastic discovery. So I know that since you're here, you already know what we are talking about, but I like to start with this uh, sort of dramatic introduction free from the mud and murky water a masterpiece from the distant past bronze statue of a boy dating back perhaps more than 40 years yes as a matter of fact the news has spread worldwide literally for this outstanding discovery of 24 bronze statues among other artifacts in an etruscan sanctuary in tuscany italy in the locality known as san casciano dei bagni the name is dei bagni the toponym the name of the place says it all in italian this means by the bats is to say it alludes to the presence of a natural spa, thermal water, which was exploited since the Etruscan age into the Roman times and also later. So an official announcement was given by the general director of the Italian museums uh, from the Ministry of Culture, and this is how the the news uh, made uh, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, diffusion all around the, the world. Uh, actually, I have to say this is the most outstanding result of a research project which started in 2017. So it's not completely new to us, and it culminated in the excavation seasons, which started in 2020. So this year was the third season, third series of seasons of excavations on the site. This project sees something like 11 entities among Italian and foreign universities, local archaeological superintendencies, the local municipality of San Casciano as well, and so on. At present, the, the, the person who's uh, uh, in, the, in the video uh, going um, uh, uh, going on is actually uh, Trabolli, Dr. Trabolli, who's uh, the uh, director of the whole project, the general director, the one coordinating all the persons uh, uh, who are joining the project. Actually, I would like to say uh, the presence for us to understand uh, better what we are talking about. Actually, the presence of uh, Roman baths uh, in this area was known, as a matter of fact, uh, since the 1700s because of the scattered presence of uh, some artifacts and uh, ruins of uh, built structures. <laughs> And that there was a community there uh, uh, was known a uh, community living, uh, even if the settlement of the city has not been discovered so far. Uh, but in the 20th century, so more recently, <laughs> uh, some excavations uh, in a necropolis revealed uh, um, the presence of a local community in which Etruscan traditions uh, showed this uh, progressive uh, blending into the Roman habits. So that's why between 2017 and 2018, non-invasive uh, uh, serving projects were started in order to identify the most suitable location for a punctual digging. That's a digging that, as I told you, uh, started in 2020. This allowed not only to bring back to light part of the sanctuary as it had been shaped in the beginning of the first century AD, you see an aerial picture of it, but also a larger quantity of votive offerings, which uh, devotees dedicated in ancient times inside this, this century. So, <clears throat> 
that I brought to light uh, hundreds of coins, mostly of Roman Imperial age, small bronze statuettes, and then, of course, also the 24 larger bronze statues, which created so much of excitement and were immediately moved, as you've seen a short time ago uh, in, the, in the video um, behind, uh, to the dedicated restoration labs for immediate intervention before uh, you know, proceeding with more detailed studies. So why this discovery is considered so extraordinary? Uh, why so much of publicity uh, has been given to it? Let's try to figure it out uh, together. An important uh, preliminary consideration I would like to say is that uh, in general, votive offerings from Etruscan sanctuaries are not something new, let's say, for those studying the Etruscan and more generally Italic archaeology. Mm? Actually, they are to be found in the majority of the collections of the museums dedicated to Etruscan civilization, which are quite many, as you can see in this map. Uh, actually, uh, we can see some other examples. These are in Villa Giulia in, in Rome, and these others are from the museum in Volterra in the province of Pisa. More uh, in particular, I would like to stress, it was a quite widespread a practice in these kind of sanctuaries for the devotees to leave an offering uh, to the venerated gods to call for their protection regarding their their health, basically, so that an anatomical reproduction of body parts were common among these offerings. Uh, like, for instance, here we see uh, an arm, but also uh, inner organs, uh, uh, uteruses are quite uh, uh, common, but not exclusive. So nothing, I would like to stress, uh, nothing unknown so far. And neither it is extraordinary the discovery of bronzes, because I'm sure you are quite aware that many and bronze objects and statues are actually, actually known. Uh, we've seen just uh, some few grave offerings, uh, Mars from Todi in Umbria, the famous uh, statue of the Chimera from Arezzo, the other smaller statuettes uh, like uh, the Plowman uh, in uh, Villa Giulia Rome. So what's the rarity in San Casciano ai Bagni? This is something that I would like to <laughs> just uh, uh, lend the, 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 the words uh, from, uh, uh, from um, uh, one of the most influential and eminent scholars of the Etruscan world. We see in this picture, Dr. Valentino Nizzi, who is uh, the director of the largest Italian museum of Etruscan, uh, of the Etruscan world, the Museo Nazionale Etrusco di Villa Giulia in Rome. Um, what is stressed uh, quite well in one of the videos he releases um, in the official channel of the museum on YouTube, which you can go and see using the subtitle um, setting in order to have an immediate translation to enjoy <laughs> firsthand uh, what he says, is that uh, the uh, since the at least since the discovery of the bronze chimera uh, from Arezzo, which is in the National Museum of Florence, Archaeological Museum of Florence at present, the chimera was discovered in the mid 1500s at the time of the Medicis. Uh, you know that uh, they choose as, uh, as official title for themselves, something that in Latin would sound like the Grand Duke of Etruria to mean Tuscany in order to create created this connection with, uh, with the roots of the Etruscan world in this region of Italy. So uh, there was a craze about Etruscan bronzes, which were collected and then classified, cataloged, uh, according more to aesthetic and artistic uh, um, elements. And uh, this is uh, uh, something that we can say in the uh, collection which was assembled in Rome by this uh, remarkable figure of the 1600, the Jesuit Athanasius Kircher, who was very influential in the intellectual life of Rome of the time, uh, even Bernini had uh, some uh, was affected by uh, some of uh, the, 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 the researches that uh, Thanasius Kircher was doing. And uh, he was an encyclopedist, if I may say so, a little bit antiliteram, but uh, an erudite with a very uh, large uh, kind of knowledge. And uh, he created what was called at the time the Wunderkammer, 
room, that is to say, a wonder room, a place where he would assemble all his uh, collections of ancient artifacts and uh, strange things coming from the opposite side of the world. Let's not forget we are in the 60s in the 1600s Europe. Uh, and this collection was something quite extraordinary. Uh, many would say this was the origin of modern museums, uh, even if the principles were quite uh, um, different. Anyway, without going too far with this, this uh, collection went uh, divided in the following centuries, but uh, the greatest part of the Etruscan bronzes uh, from Athanasius Kircher are uh, one of the nuclei of the museum of Villa Giulia. I already mentioned to you. This approach, as a matter of fact, favored an antiquarian approach to the study of such artifacts. So that's just because, not that I like particularly this picture, but it's just for you to show these two statuettes um, probably don't even come from the same context, but they were put side by side for aesthetic reasons. This kind of approach actually makes us lose totally what uh, in reality makes uh, such objects uh, meaningful behind their extrinsic value, that is to say the beauty, the aesthetic appeal, that is to say the context, which is uh, the most meaningful aspect uh, in the perspective of studying the past. In the case of San Casciano dei Bagni, the bronze have been uncovered during a project which involved uh, several different professional figures, archaeologists, uh, geologists, uh, zoobotanists, uh, and, uh, and so on. And uh, of course, also restorers in this in this part of the story. And of course, they were also uh, rescued, found and rescued during a scientific excavation carried out to understand the place, not only to collect nice, good-looking artworks. Um, so. Probably uh, more importantly, these uh, objects from San Casciano can reveal a lot, not only about uh, the history of art, which is a uh, pleasant, but uh, also about the people who commissioned them and had uh, these uh, statues uh, dedicated in the century. That is to say, it's like uh, using uh, the statues as a tool mm, beyond their extrinsic value for their intrinsic values, which is uh, not the one related to the fact they are bronzes or a precious metal, uh, but uh, tools to have, uh, let's say, an anthropological view, so to say, on the life of uh, these ancient people. And this is made possible by the fact that it is a, um, an investigated context. Moreover, a second reason why this discovery is so important, now we are switching from generally archaeology to something more specific about the Etruscan civilization. What is important is the location itself of San Casciano e Bagni, which is considered particularly meaningful. We are in central Italy, in Tuscany, close to Umbria and Latium, the other regions which were affected by the Etruscan uh, civilization. <laughs> I wanted to share with you this a screenshot from Google Maps in case you're curious. It's already marked there and you can go exploring. And uh, San Casciano is not far from, uh, the, is it really in the heart of the Etruscan world and not far from Orvieto, which was a sort of federal sanctuary uh, for the Etruscans. Here <coughs> in the video from Google Maps, you can see uh, <coughs> one thing which uh, characterized them characterizes the city still nowadays, the whole area, as a matter of fact, the presence of springs of hot waters, which makes the place a, a touristic destination. And as a matter of fact, I spent a relaxing weekend there something like 15 years ago, long before this was even in the, in the mind of the discoverers. Anyway, this is the site which has been investigated. Uh, it, this is uh, specifically called the Bagno Grande, which means uh, great bath. And uh, possibly, rather, <laughs> I would dare to say, 
very likely this is just a section of the sanctuary which must have included several other buildings and structures revolving around uh, the springs here you can see on the upper part of the picture actually there are some of the pools which were built in the spot uh, during the age of the Medici as a matter of fact uh, so this sector uh, probably already existing in Etruscan times uh, since uh, they found uh, some uh, archaic uh, building techniques in the wall here on the western side of the structure, uh, actually was uh, rearranged and built as we see it now in the late Augustan age, they say. That is to say within the year 30 AD, at the very beginning uh, of the first century AD. We can see here the entrance, which is uh, um, highlighted by this a red circle originally it had two columns so it was a like a, a monumental monumental kind of entrance to the building um, uh, for the devotees uh, entering into the structure there would have been an altar to the left which is barely visible in this picture here and a large circular basin here which was removed during the excavation uh, these uh, are devices for the devotees to to leave uh, their offerings uh, upon uh, uh, arrival uh, before entering the sanctuary, uh, uh, properly speaking. This entrance, in fact, uh, gave access uh, to this uh, almost rectangular building uh, with uh, uh, porches uh, supporting, supported by columns on the side. Actually, they were, they say they found the traces of benches which run uh, along the walls. And uh, uh, by this bench, uh, they found uh, cooking ware pottery, that is to say, <laughs> there was uh, something going on here, maybe uh, part of the ritual which was uh, performed, uh, which is uh, still to be investigated. And at the center of the building, actually the pool with the hot water a spring in nature in the site. Uh, those visiting the sanctuary would dive into the pool uh, to make, uh, let's say, a healthy use of the healing powers of this water. As a matter of fact, the spring of Bagno Grande is the most important in the area in terms of flow rate. It runs 25 liters per second, which makes 90 Tea. 1000 liters per hour incredible amount of 2.5 million liters uh, per day and the original temperature at the moment of the the water springing out is 42 celsius 107 fahrenheit so that uh, during the excavation so that was also uh tricky in terms of logistics they had to work with the uh, drain pumps uh, and sometimes it didn't work like in the case of this uh, picture more frequently they worked in the Mad, as a matter of fact, and uh, uh, what they uh, they were sharing uh, with the journalists and with the ministry uh, and and so on is that very often they had to when they had uh, this uh, flow of mud and hot water uh, coming, uh, they had to use a metal detector every time they uh, had the, the sensation that something big was coming out of the mud in order to be able to be ready to catch what and rescue properly what was uh, being uh, uncovered. Here you can see also like in the previous picture, the flowing water, I'm sure. And this is uh, despite the damage the, in the head, uh, this is the statue of uh, Hygieia, the goddess of health, uh, cleanliness, uh, hygiene, and this is uh, after uh, after uh, being rescued by the field director, Dr. Uh, Mariotti. Um, these uh, these uh, pictures uh, get get us uh, straight to the dedication of the sanctuary. So far, together with Igea, uh, they can say that found proof of the worship of uh, this uh, goddess, which is known in southern Lazio, not far from Rome, Fortuna Primigenia, primigenial fortune. Uh, worshipped in uh, Palestrina, not far from Rome, and also of uh, the cult of Isis, uh, the Egyptian goddess, uh, which actually became the main goddess uh, uh, of the century in the course of the second century AD. But
what they found also this altar with a clear dedication to Apollo. Uh, you can see uh, some of the letters in the inscription uh, here. So this is to say which were the deities which were worshipped here to whom the devotees would, uh, you know, address their plea to of, uh, of uh, healing. We were saying that the statues were found in the mud in a context that characterized by absence of oxygen. So uh, the surface of the bronze statues is not oxidated. And this uh, is uh, something, uh, you know, a little bit uh, uncommon, another peculiarity of, of this discovery. And lab analysis will determine whether this is to be considered uh, an important factor in the preservation of bronzes. And, uh, you know, we are waiting for the lab analysis, which will take some time time. This uh, statue here is the same we saw before in the short video with the restorer, um, uh, Dr. Basilisi, uh, taking care of it, uh, makes me think that I should say something about the presence of these infant statues, which are very common. Why are so common? Because, of course, of the high inf infant mortality of the times, which was around 50%, so that it's not uncommon to find the statues Represent, representing children. And in this case, we see something very important. There's a child uh, wears uh, a medallion around the neck, which is the famous Bulla, B-U-L-L-A, -L -L uh, the medallion which protected the kid until the end of uh, puberty, let's say, uh, so that uh, some of these objects uh, have been found. They existed in the real life of these uh, kids and the uh, little amulets were put inside it, hidden, but to protect the kid. So elements meant as a ritual protection and also in the sanctuary where the statue was uh, dedicated. Not uncommonly also uh, are to be found these uh, swaddled children. Here you see the two directors very happy with uh, one of these uh, uh, swaddled children. And uh, uh, here we see also the, the same uh, uh, statuettes after their preliminary restorations, uh, the uh, preliminary interventions of restorations. And then they found body parts, as we've mentioned, but I would like to stress one last important element before uh, living. Statues, as it was the practice, were engraved with inscriptions. Here we go. These inscriptions are both in Latin and in Etruscan. So they represent a very important element to define the process of Romanization that Etruria underwent after the Roman conquest. And uh, what is remarkable is that uh, Mm, it seems that uh, some of the traditions of the Etruscan word uh, just uh, survived well into the Roman era, and some of these Etruscan inscriptions uh, seem to be later than the Latin ones, and so this is why someone said maybe this discovery will help us understand better this uh, process that the Etruscan civilization underwent after the conquest of Rome. It was not uh, swallowed completely, but it was assimilated slowly, and uh, there was a real symbiosis between the two. Last but not least, the greatest part of this statue dated to a period of the second century BC to the first century AD, which actually saw Roma, the empire crossed by uh, internal uh, wars and civil wars, so the so-called civil war, the, uh, the, the wars, uh, the struggle for power, uh, the time of Caesar, the time of Julius Caesar, of, uh, of Mark Antony and Octavian and so on. What's uh, the, the, the picture which emerges out of this century is that, is that the local families kept on living peacefully, uh, at least in the frame of this um, sanctuary. So while the world was on fire, literally outside, this was an oasis of uh, peace and uh, concord. And uh, the, the, as a matter of fact, the sanctuary was in use until the end of the fourth, the beginning of the fifth century. The place was abandoned, was not destroyed. This is very important because they uh, just uh, dismantled the columns, uh, put the, the capitals upside down in order to allow the, um, the, um, uh, the, the, the pool 
holes to be uh, covered and this actually is uh, what saved this uh, this uh, statue it was a great sign of respect so that's uh, uh well christianity the, the passage to christianity did not necessarily mean the total rejection of all that had happened before local traditions of uh, of religiousness were somehow respected and uh, there is a proof that the place despite that pool was no longer in use as it had been in the centuries before but it was still frequented at least by people because they found small oil lamps you know those uh, uh, lucerns uh, which are made out of terracotta bearing uh, uh, some uh, you know, uh, very easy to understand the Christian symbols like crosses and so on. So as a sign that the, the, the healing power of um, of the water was uh, still unknown and despite no longer associated with uh, uh, with uh, with the pagan gods, uh, actually, uh, it kept on living and was a great part in the history for the local communities. For the rest, what can I say? This is something very exciting. What uh, the, the, the great thing that they have done, and I'm talking about the field director, the general director, and also the Ministry of Culture of Italy, actually it was given importance to a team kind of a project. We which uh, is uh, able to show uh, on a wider public, on a wider uh, audience, uh, what a contemporary archaeology um, can do in terms of uh, uh, you know, reconstructing, reconstructing history. And uh, this uh, is, uh, goes uh, side by side with extraordinary discoveries. Uh, in Italy, we already enjoyed the extraordinary discovery of bronzes. It's just 50 years since the discovery of the famous uh, Riace bronzes. I will talk about it in uh, one of the uh, seminars about uh, which is uh, which are forthcoming. Uh, but actually, these were found uh, uh, underwater and uh, completely deprived of their context. So even now, after 40 years, we have so many questions about the bronzes from Riace in Calabria, southern Italy. In this case, San Casciano, of course, it will require time, but we are going to have lots of answers, even before we are able to, uh, you know, to ask the questions.